we're gonna try this one more time. It says it's recording. It looks like it's recording. Today is October 6th, 1996. Fifth. Next to October 5th, thank you. <laughs> I've had a problem with that all week. Um, and we're checking to see if the unit is recording. Now that we think that we're recording, this is Chris Payton, and I'm here with Mandy Mercer Nader and Jim Corwin. And we're going to talk a little bit about Johnny Mercer family history. Okay. Um, okay, your dad's parents' names were Lillian Sisevich. Right. And George Anderson Mercer. Right. And you said his mother had sisters, right? Yeah. He had some aunts. Yeah. What were their names? I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. Hattie, I remember Aunt Hattie. Okay. So there but I don't remember them all. No. Okay. So there was an Aunt Hattie. Do you know about how many there were? Um, no. You'd have to get that from my cousin Aunt Hattie. Aunt Hattie. Okay. And on your father's side, he had three brothers. Yes. George, yeah. Walter, and Hugh. Right. Right. And his sister, Julie. Right. Okay. Do you know who had which children? Okay. George had okay. Elizabeth mm -hmm. and George mm -hmm. Jr. And those were from, those were his children. Okay. Okay, Walter had Anne and Louise. Okay. And Hugh had a uh, little Hugh or Hugh Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, Daddy had uh, myself and my brother, John Jeff. Mm -hmm. And uh, Julie had uh, Nancy, my mm -hmm. cousin Nancy. Okay. And on your mother's side, she had two sisters? She had two sisters. And their names were Claire. Okay. A I R E. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Deborah. Okay. We call her Debbie. Okay. And did they have children? Claire was childless. She's okay. uh, still a virgin at uh, 89 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I guess that... Don't play that tape back for <laughs> <laughs> I was proud of it. <laughs> and uh, Debbie has two children, Joyce uh -huh. and Johnny. And John. Okay. Um, okay, so you had a whole bunch of cousins here. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, about eight. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 and then of course they all had children. Right, that happens, <laughs> that happens with people. Yeah. Um, did your parents, relatives come west to visit much or ever that you remember? Yeah. The Savannah people and the, the East Coast people? As a rule, um, uh, Granny, that's uh, Mercer, mm -hmm. there was Granny, Mercer, and Nana Meltzer. And Granny Mercer would come to visit with her daughter Julie. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, we would go back there at least once a year. You did? Because we had to visit the relatives. Uh, as far as uh, Claire and Deb, Debbie, they would come visit us and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you didn't see much of your dad's brothers? Not too Pretty much, much. except when I went to visit. So when, when you went to Savannah, but they, yeah. didn't, they didn't come with us. No. Okay. When did you go to Savannah? What Was there a particular time of the year? Or? Just different times she chose to want to go. Usually we would go back east. There he would work, say, New York in the summer. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we'd go down to Savannah during that time. Take a break. So we'd stay, say, in New York for the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And then the latter part of the summer, we go down to Savannah. Oh, the hot part. And visit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part. <laughs> the devastating part. <laughs> a couple of times we go at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few times, I think three times we went at Christmas. Mm -hmm. But usually my father only traveled by train, so when he went, it was usually just the one trip 
mm-hmm. to New York and then a side, side trip to Savannah. Where did you stay in Savannah? Yeah. It may have changed over time. Usually in Granny's house or in a hotel, I guess. That's where we used to stay. Mm-hmm. So did the Moon River House come later then? That was later after I, was, I had matured and drunk, got married. Okay. <laughs> it's a neat looking house to have kids yeah. around in. So we thought, oh, well, yeah. maybe they had it for a while. No, I missed it. I missed it. He got that afterwards. <laughs> um, let's see. And did your mom go to Savannah? Yeah, she would go to. Okay. The family would travel together. Um, what kind of things did you do either in Savannah or on vacations elsewhere? Okay. And we know that your mother liked museums and art and classical music, stuff like that. What did we do? Well, a lot. Of time, we always went to the beach and rented a house, or we went to here to Palm Springs and rented a dude ranch. And then after they started dissipating, we uh, owned a home. My father bought a home in 1950 in Palm Springs. Yeah, and uh, so we just come and hang out. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did I do for pleasure? Uh, with my father, he would take me to ball games. To, he liked hockey games and football games oh, really? and stuff like that. And my mother would take me to the ballet. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I did by myself is I was, uh, I guess, a movie fan like every other kid in Hollywood. And spent most of my waking hours in the movies or in a skating rink because I like to go ice skating. Or we go, a lot of my friends and I went down to Will Rogers. They had a riding stable and we ride horses. Really? Sounds uh, like with my dad, stuff. I was mostly hanging around. He liked to go to games and stuff. <laughs> and when I got very too old, he took the guys. <laughs> <laughs> so baseball, hockey? Yeah, he loved sports. Oh, had no Football. Idea. Um, one of the things we've been trying to sort out is where all you people lived. He, you had different houses at different times. There was Newport Beach, right? Okay. And we thought... I started... Uh, where do I start? I was they house. moved <clears throat> to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And I think they had an apartment. <clears throat> but I don't remember where it was. Okay. Then right before I came... Right along before they got me, they moved to DeLong Prey in Hollywood. Okay. <coughs> uh, then uh, they had gone down. They the buildings grew in around us. I mm-hmm. was we lived there I guess fifteen years. At least I was around fifteen or fourteen. I was fourteen. Um, they started building apartments around us there in Hollywood. So. My parents really had to sell the house, and uh, so they sold the house on the Long Prey. And had to, they had been thinking of buying a house. They already had a house in Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. They got that in 1950, and we come down for Easter's and stuff. But they decided to go down to Newport and buy a house, and uh, decided they were going to build a house in Bel Air. So they sold the house there, they were going to build a house in Bel Air, they bought a lot. And they were going to live in the Newport house, which was meant to be a uh, uh, vacation house, uh, until they built the home in Bel Air. Mm-hmm. What happened was, so they got my brother and I down there, and it was like, uh, we, we, we won, we, 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 we threw a hissy fit. We, we had gone to school and savored the life of a small town and enjoyed it very much in Newport. It was a typical beach, small town place. Nobody knew who anybody was or cared. Or, you know, half the kids had never even been up to Hollywood. You know, they didn't know what Hollywood was. And it was really, you know, a great life. And uh, uh, we threw a hissy fit. We were supposed to move back. And I, uh, my father gave in, but she shouldn't have done, I guess. 
but it was the greatest thing that ever happened to my brother and I, so we ended up, we grew, he was in first grade at the time. At yeah, the Newport Beach House. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I started out high school there, and uh, we spent, I, I graduated high school, went off to college, and went off to New York, uh, all from the Newport House, which was, I thought was the greatest thing ever happened to be growing up in a small town and not in that, you know, Hollywood setting or anything. About how many years now? That was a good, uh... 1953, 1954, you so, moved to Newport, right? Yeah. Approximately. And the Bel Air house wasn't even built till That was 1960. When I married his father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... And they tried to move my brother back there, but he only lasted one year. And he said, can I stay in Newport? And, and my father got an apartment down in Newport. And you went to New York. And I was oh. off married and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I ran off to New York. Right? In 1958, Eight. right? No, 59. 59. And then I met his dad in 1960 and we got, no, 58 we, I met. 59 I met him. 1959. We got married a year later. Mm -hmm. And uh, came back to California. And then Bebop and Granger, they built they built the house in 1960 in yeah. Bel Air. Yeah, they it was just finishing. They were just they just finished it one day, and I got married. Okay, and that was December of 1960. 60. Yeah. And then there was the big Bel Air fire. When was the Bel Air fire? That was November of 61. You were right there. So that was like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> October. 61. Yeah. But their house didn't get burned at all, did no. it? One of the people that I spoke with um, said that he had occasion to call Mr. Mercer to ask him if he wanted to appear on a show or to do whatever. And that Mr. Mercer said, um, well, can I call you back? And the guy said, no, 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 I, I need to know now. I said, well, I'm, I'm on my roof. And there's, yeah. a, there's a fire. <laughs> yeah. I, I really need to call you back. And it turned out it was those fires. That's and right. he was up with the hose trying to wet That's everything right. down so that the house yeah. didn't go. And then I was living in Brentwood at the time, and so he came down to my apartment and we picked up, I was pregnant with him, and we picked up uh, his, my, my, my oldest son, Jonathan, and I picked up, he was my stepson. Mm -hmm. And I, we picked up my brother, and uh, <laughs> we went out to lunch, <laughs> and just watched him burn. Took my bird with me because I was afraid the fire might jump the line and come down to Gorham Avenue and burn, <laughs> burn us up too, or something. <laughs> but it escaped, and it didn't burn. But that was another interesting thing. You know how you have to, you grab your important things. So. Uh, he grabbed his typewriter and some of the songs he was working on at the time. Your dad. Did. That's what, that, that was, those were his important papers that he got. <laughs> did they have to move out for any, I don't know much about the fires, did they have Yeah, they had to stay out for like a week. Really? Yeah. But yeah, so he got his typewriter out of there <laughs> and all his, uh, his papers and those papers he was working on at the time. <laughs> those would be the key things, I think. Yeah, that's what he threw in the back of the car when they said leave. Probably the pets, too, if there were any. Yeah. <laughs> no, they, I don't think we had any pets up there yet. They didn't have. They were still down in Newport. <laughs> okay, so your mom and dad then lived in Bel Air starting around 1960. Yeah. 60, thereabouts. Okay. Well, that gives us dates on the, mm -hmm. on the houses. When did they buy the Savannah house? Yeah, the Moon River House, you know? Well, it was after Daddy and I were married. No. Much after? Or was it after Nikki was born? Yeah, I think, remember when Granny came? When, when Granny came to Palm Springs? Yeah, and she was getting so bad, and she was saying, you have to have a home there. That was about 1965. I don't know. It was 66. Something, something like that. Yeah, because I was about four or five. Yeah, know? I think that's what they thought. And Nikki was like two. Mm -hmm. so. So, so then. So we really never spent time there. Okay. It just I looked think like my brother a... spent one time there. Yeah. But that was about it, I think. 
I don't know, the people in Savannah know better, they remember more. <laughs> yeah, they might. Because uh, Lucille, uh -huh. Lucy, Lu Louise. Louise, right there. She, she said that uh, Aunt Louise went in and grabbed a whole bunch of stuff out of the house, you know, before it sold. Oh, really? And um, so she had a bunch of stuff, so she sent me a whole bunch of stuff of the house. Mm -hmm and uh, some pictures and stuff, and she sent it to me just, it was weird, it arrived the, the day my husband died. Really? And it was really freaky here. She sent these pictures that my father had done and things, you know, because my mother didn't give me any pictures of them. Oh, really? I didn't have any pictures my father had drew. Now all of a sudden, I had, she sent me, my cousin sent me pictures. Nice. So those just come this year or back when the house was May, sold? just in May. Really? Just in May. Oh and just as she, she well, got them in 76, so but she'd been holding them. <laughs> oh, well, well, that's what I was trying to figure yeah. out because I know the house yeah, she was held sold them for 20 sometime years. Back. And, uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Aunt, my cousin, my, yeah, my aunt Louise was holding it, just had them in her closet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my cousin Louise, when she went in the nursing home, my cousin Louise found them in her closet mm -hmm. and sent them to me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, poor mom had no pictures, but now we're trying to get her. She did get one picture. She's, uh, yeah. Grandma left her one picture to be. But she to. promised me another picture. It was yeah. one picture. I said, "This is the picture I want. I don't want anything else." I said, "I want." Kid, promise me that. I don't want anything else. You don't even have to give me a stick of gum. I want that picture. But they took that too. Mm. Which picture was that? It was a picture. It was in a. These guys were riding in a... Oh, the buggy? Yeah. And we get people calling us about that all the time. Oh, I don't know. She promised me where that it is. picture. She yeah. promised it to me. Where did it go, do you know? No, she was... She was a little careless with... Uh, <laughs> but we found a bunch of... We found a sketch. She just, just gave Paul away Springs pictures. House, a bunch of she she just gave away pictures. And so we and then, uh, those. Just never gave any away to me. Oh, no. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Now I got some. We mm -hmm. said, <laughs> "Better like that." Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what else can we wander through this time around. Um, who do you remember visiting your parents? Now, we've, we talked about relatives again, okay. and um, you had a few people come west, and then you all went east sometimes. But who else would come? Just local people, friends and colleagues and whatever. And just kind of, come into the house? Yeah, just friends, casual party. Well, they have parties. Mm -hmm. So they would have parties. And uh, the ones I remember most were ones that were really shy, and they'd come and sit in my bedroom sometime, and that was Mel Ferrer. Mm -hmm. He was very shy to come and he'd sit down and talk to me. I said, what are you doing in here? Why don't you open the mic? <laughs> oh, it's getting boring. I'd rather talk to you. Oh, <laughs> uh, what was my big crush of all time? Yeah. Was, of course, Nat King Cole. Really? My mother had this great big table in the living room and it had a, it was sort of glass like this, but it was long and, and it was a mirrored, Beautiful decorated mirrored thing, and then they put the mirrored thing on it down the legs. There's a table, and I would hide under there. I know they knew I was there, but I pretended like I was hiding. And uh, Dad and Nat would work out songs, you know, that that Nat was going to record and stuff, and they rehearse it. And, oh. <laughs> Oh, my heart still beats <laughs> thinking about it. It was just the most thrilling thing of my life. It was just so exciting. It would have to be. Oh, God. So yeah. sometimes he'd come to your house and, and they'd work on material. Yeah, for a seconds. lot, a lot. Really? A lot, yeah. So, uh, then, of course, the Westons were always around. and <clears throat> um, Margaret Whiting's mother. Mm -hmm. Was always around. She was a funny character. I like her. She used to come all over. Eleanor. Mm -hmm. 
Eleanor. She was cool. She came over a lot. Um, I don't know all the friends. For a while, we have people stay like, there was this guy. I don't know how the story goes exactly, but he, Daddy had stopped at a town and I guess had gotten to hear this guy's songs and he called him up and he said, you got to come out here. And the guy came and he stayed with us and I was writing songs while I was out here. And then he met this lady and uh, I guess they fell in love. They were writing some songs for this ice capades. And they fell in love and they got married and uh, now they got more Oscars than my father. Really? <laughs> the Bergman. Oh, the Bergman. There was Alan Bergman and Alan Bergman. Yeah, Alan stayed with us when he first came out. Oh. He was like uh, one of Daddy's. Daddy was one of his mentor or whatever. He was mentor to a lot of people. Who else can you think of? What, that he was mentor to? Mm -hmm. Livingston and Evans. Mm -hmm. He helped them out a lot. They helped a lot of people, but those in particular, you know, the people who have always come back and been very grateful. Um, Did you ever get to go out much and see your dad when he was working? Either, either when he was performing, which much of that might have been before you were old enough to to be doing things like that, or recording? Well, at Capitol. Or? I was too little when he was like recording at Capitol. I, I think I was there. I know I was there because one time I watched an Easter parade from his office. I mean a Christmas parade from his office. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't remember that a lot. I know that uh, when he got around to doing, he was doing musical chairs, I used to come up and watch that. And then whenever he'd go do a Jack Parr show and stuff like that, I, he took me. Mm -hmm. And he took me a lot everywhere, but he would like have me babysat. Like, uh, like he took me to the studio. It was KTTV or something, and he had to go do some work there. So he brings me to the show. He's babysitting. I don't know what my mother was always doing, but he was always babysitting me. And he took me in, and as uh, Bozo show was on, so he takes me, sits me down in the Bozo show. And uh, I had to be on the Bozo show while he went and worked. <laughs> I mean, like, I had to be on it, right? <laughs> you know? So he'd do things like that, and that way I, I, I had a lot of fun. Like, he was doing uh, shows, and he'd take me to the set. To a set. Usually, like when it was at Disney, he'd take, when he was working with Disney a lot, he'd take me to the set. He'd just dump me off at some set where there were a lot of kids. And, then he could do his work, come back and pick me up, and I just hang out. <laughs> you know, so he'd do things like that. Well, and instead of sitting in front of the TV, he would. Yeah. <laughs> on the TV. So, yeah, I was always seeing him. Yeah. You know. writing, he was writing at the studio, or he was sitting around at home. Sometimes he'd just be sitting on the couch and he'd get up and start writing things down or something. Really? Yeah. We've had an awful lot of people tell us that they frequently thought he was asleep. Yeah. And then he would either suddenly contribute a comment that indicated yeah. that he'd been there the whole time, exactly. even though he had his eyes closed. Exactly. Or that, you know, he'd come up with the answer to something. Exactly. <laughs> so he, he told people, you should keep a paper, a, a pad. Songwriters would say, young songwriters would say, what is the most, you know, um, helpful thing I should do? He says, you have to keep a pad everywhere. In the toilet, by your bed, in your car, everywhere. You have to have a pad because you never know where your ideas are going to go. Well, you we actually have, no have a strip of toilet paper. Yeah. That he wrote on. You're kidding. Uh-uh. Oh, I'd love to see that. We have, come on, when, call us when you get ready to visit and, oh, well. and we'll pull things for you. Uh, 
we have things scribbled on check deposit stubs, you know, the, the slips that are in the back of your checkbook. We have date calen calendar pages, date book pages. We have the strip of toilet paper, which <laughs> it's single ply wherever it was. It was not home and it was not somewhere fancy. We figure airport maybe or bar. That's mm -hmm. been the two guesses we've come up with. There's a paper napkin. Yeah, always the scribbles. Paper napkins. <laughs> um, there's a torn off piece of like a facial tissue box, Kleenex or puffs or something like that, with wow. some scribbles. I think, if I remember rightly, that we have like a little eight millimeter film carton that's been squashed flat and. and <laughs> It, it testifies to yeah. where one might be when, when these inspirations came along. So it's been kind of fun, you know, figuring out what they are. Now writing in felt tip on toilet paper is not the best way yeah. to <laughs> preserve can, can what you you're read, Can you read his handwriting? I think so. Yeah. I haven't looked at that one recently. Um, generally we can make it out. <laughs> Some of the things like the, the tissue box, I mean it's glossy, stiff stuff and he, it was pencil which doesn't, I mean, ink would have been easier yeah, than that. So sometimes it's a little long. bit hard. Wow. And we were sifting through these things and, and struggling hard to be sure that, you know, everything got sorted to an appropriate place. And late one afternoon I was sifting through and came across this little envelope fragment. And it said, Ibliadu, Ubliadi, I hope I'm in the proper key. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking this far too seriously. <laughs> We're just going to say miscellaneous thoughts. There we <laughs> go. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And somebody else can figure out if this is part of something or if this was going to go somewhere. Um, some of them are little sketches that are quite nice. And when we found yeah, he used to sketch little cartoon things. Right. We have one that he did of himself. Yeah. A little sort of a portrait kind of thing. Um, sometimes there are thoughts. And it's a fragmentary thought. And if you flip the paper over, there's a little more well-developed thought. And then sometimes because things were scattered, everything was mixed up. Sometimes you'll then find what looks like a more, yet more completed version of that that you can kind of kind of group together. But no, he wrote on everything. And yeah. We have the evidence of it. <laughs> Let's see. Now, did you have when he wrote my Cub Scout theme song anywhere? I don't know. How does it go? <laughs> Shall we say it? Shall we say it? He, uh... He wrote a thing for my Cub Scout troop. When and, was this? Uh, about when? And I'd say probably 1969. Mm -hmm. Does that sound yeah. about right? Yeah, that's a lot. 69. Um, and it was called and he, The Men of the, the Werewolf, Werewolf Den. Den. And he brought all the boys, I brought all the boys over to the house and he taught them all the song. <laughs> that's right. And he typed it all up so that the Den mothers could have it and they sang it in the big yeah, they had a pack meeting once a month, and all the Cub Scout troops would come together. And uh, um, how did it go? It went. Uh, we're we're men, men of, of the werewolf den. Yeah. We're fearless, brave, and true. That's right. We're men, men of the werewolf den, and we know what to do. Don't right. watch from there. We now did. our hair was neat. Um, our our yeah, nails were clean. clean. We helped old, old ladies across the street. We're men of the werewolf den. Ah ooh, ah ooh, ah ooh. Ah, ooh. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was gonna ask if you got to howl. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, howl. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was his boy. This is. They were birthday buddies. He was supposed to be born mm -hmm. November 18th. Mm -hmm. But he didn't even start coming until midnight. He was born 1230 November 19th. Ah. Yeah. But that didn't matter. Didn't matter. They were birth right. They still had their birthday on the same day. It's a birthday <laughs> party together and everything. They That's so. right. <laughs> no, he'd come to my Little League baseball games. <laughs> And the parents would hound him, boy. <laughs> for what? For autographs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they'd give him a hard time. And he was always hounding for autographs, yeah. but as he said to me, I said, Daddy, yeah. let's go. I want to go now. He said, sit down. He says, it was what for them. Well, you wouldn't have any food in your mouth, so you sit down. <laughs> That's right. And you'd right. wait for me, and he'd go be signing it. Yeah. He says, you owe it. 
to the people, you know, <laughs> you hold the clothes on your back to these people, so you sit down and shut up and yeah. I'll keep signing my... Here's a big kid. Here's a big kid. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn this over. Um, see, we talked about the houses and we talked about family history, some of it. Um, what about after you and your brother grew up and and went away. Now your parents moved to the Bel Air house. Yeah. And rock and roll came in and things kind of changed and stuff. And a couple people have told us that that your dad was was hit kind of hard by by his kind of, his kind of music not being not being as popular anymore. No, he wasn't happy with rock and roll. He was happy with some of it if it was good. Mhm. Mm he just wasn't happy with, you know, he just had to change his lifestyle. He had to start writing like, uh, like uh, with Man, he started writing with Mancini and, uh, you know, got his thought, instead of having musicals to write for, you know, although he wanted to do shows and he did that uh, Foxy and he did Good Companions. And before that, they did the Saratoga, but they weren't really, you know, but uh, that was, you know, what he liked to do. But yeah, he wasn't happy with it, but he, you know, kept on, you know. Oh, he did. He did beautiful you know. things in those later years. Um, for Foxy, did they go to Alaska? Yep. I thought oh. so. <laughs> I thought so. What do you know about that? I didn't go. Let's didn't see, ask my brother about if you could get a hold of him. Did he go? He went. He went up there. Okay. And I, I was, I was at home with children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I missed all that. We found a couple snapshots, and I was looking at him. I thought, gee, this just sort of says Foxy to me somehow. Yeah. I had a feeling that that it was from you know kind of on the way up and yeah. And once they got there and all that. Um, but you heard the uh, daddy's uh, that. Oh, the, what's the, the Hebrew Boys Association the, yeah, the record and all that, and the stories on that. I've heard some of it. We, we <laughs> have it. I have to say, I need to sit down, and it's been reissued. Um, yeah. DRG put a CD version out. Oh, I want it. You want it? Um, I think it has a little bit more material. On oh, it I want I mean. it. Yeah. A CD, because I don't know how to record that into it. You know, I yeah. got a record, but I don't know. Well, we had the LP, to... and actually we used a few little pieces of it in the exhibit, and there was a soundtrack. Yeah. And because he talks about how, who influenced him in certain yeah. ways in his writing and all that, they had picked a few of those little pieces off to include in the soundtrack. Um, and just, I think maybe last year or the year before it was reissued, I think it's called An Evening with Johnny Mercer. Where would you get it? Well, I know it's on DRG. I assume a good record store could order it. Because I think it's still, I mean, it, it just can't, it's only been the last couple of years. I don't think okay. it could be, you know, out of, out of print already. Okay. And I think well, there's more get if not, will bug you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have a Tower Records. Um, and I'm, I mean, I know you must have them out here, yeah. too. And that's one of the better places. When we have to find strange things, it's one of the places that we call. <laughs> we get most of our stuff. The library has the collection development department that does yeah. all the book ordering. And they have vendors, and they just give the vendors these lists and say find it. So I don't honestly know where a lot of our copies come from, but um, I do know that that one's come out again. Because mm -hmm. we get calls, and we've been getting calls for the LP, and I said, well, don't know about the LP, but you can get a CD. Okay, great. And then people say, well, we want a tape. I say, that well, was so good. Yeah, it, it really was. Did he get back into performing? Which I know he made some records for Pi in the 70s. It would have been probably around the same time. Well, he never really performed ever. He would just perform like, uh, like say someone would call him up and want to do a, you know, like when he did a lot of that UF, UFO. UFO. <laughs> UFO during the war. Yeah, he didn't stuff. pursue entertaining. He, he waited. He, he mean, pursued he it. He loved to entertain. That was his dream. That was his life. But, uh, it was more that, uh, it, you know, there was, it came, 
He, he did it, say, on shows or somebody called him up to entertain on a, mm -hmm. um, uh, a volunteer thing or, a, you know, or, you know, if anybody asked him off show, he'd go, boy. He loved to sing. So if anybody asked him to entertain, he would go. He you would mentioned go. The, um, the musical chairs show. Now, that was yeah. television, right? Yeah. What can you tell me about that? What was the show? What was the show? It was, uh, it was Daddy and uh, Bobby Troop and um, Julie Christie and Stan Freeberg, and I don't remember the... Uh, the master of ceremonies or whatever you call it. Steve Allen maybe? Is he involved? I don't remember. But they used to supposedly ask them questions that people would send them questions that they couldn't answer. Or that they would answer um, uh, about music. Mm -hmm. And they go around and say, do you, you know, somebody had a ask, they ask you to answer about, do you know about this thing? And they go around and, you know, each person would answer about it. And uh, uh, then they had to do a song. At the end, they pick a song that they were supposed to uh, be able to think of and sing right there on the spot. Of course, it was a song Daddy had written, you know. <laughs> Oh, you know, he sat down before the show, wrote out these lines. Okay, this is what we're doing. <laughs> you know, but it was, uh, I don't know, I don't know and how was it long it lasted, I mean, how long did yeah, it last? A, well, we have a photograph that shows like a quiz panel kind of a thing. It's it's a like a semicircular curved okay. um, desk thing with people sitting behind. Kind of like, what's my line, or, you know, that, yeah. kind, of, that kind of a show. And that's all we know. I mean, we have it. People look, this, look right in. Supposedly, write in and ask questions from to see if they knew them. Like, uh, who was the piano player hanging from the rope? And the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they make these. They ask questions uh, that perhaps they couldn't answer. You know, mm -hmm. and they have to. Uh, so they try oh, to sure, I know stump the musicians. Yeah, like, <laughs> like oh, we know that one. No, 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 no. Yeah, I never got to see Bebo much on TV. Well, yeah, this was, that was, yeah. This was, I, long this was when I was in high school. So. Yeah, this would have been 50s. Yeah. So it was, n neither you nor I could have, <laughs> could have, could have seen much <laughs> of it. I can't imagine it. So. <laughs> but we always kind of wondered because we had the picture and we said, well, there's a TV camera in the picture. It's a bunch of people behind a desk. I was like, yeah, everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved it. Was it nationwide or was it local or do you know? In those days, Everything was really local. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was. The, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't, yeah, I think it was local. Everything I think was local there. Because I know I hadn't heard of it. Yeah. Is, I mean, I'm not a great early TV expert, but you know the big shows I'm kind of familiar with. You said and he then did, of course he had the radio shows when he was before that. Chesterfield show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Johnny Lucky Rooster's. Strikes. Oh, he had the Lucky Strike show? Like something, or something, I don't know what it was called, but it was Lucky Strike. And we have some clippings that talk about <coughs> the Johnny Mercer Music Shop yeah. show. And it's not entirely clear to us if these overlapped, or if the names changed, or if they were completely distinct. No, I had different shows. The Chesterfield show was one thing. Well, say one would end, then he'd somehow finagle another one. Mm -hmm. You know. <coughs> he had one that's like Harry... The trump, trumpet player. Harry James. Harry James. It was, uh, I don't remember, the camel, something cavalcade or something. Oh, the camel cavalcade? Camel cavalcade, <coughs> camel camel, yeah. So they were different, you know, they have different names. Mm -hmm. You know, they, the one would fold, I guess, and he'd start up another one or finagle another one. Yeah, we're hoping that. Because he always wanted to perform, he always wanted to be on. So if he could get a TV show or a television or a radio show or whatever was at, there at the time, mm -hmm. he wanted to be an actor. He came out to Hollywood to act. We understood you know, that. He came out to Hollywood and uh, he said, okay, I'm going to write and I have to be in the movie. And so they said, no, we don't. <laughs> okay, we did a movie. We don't need to do any other. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen any of his movies? 
Yeah, I did see one. We saw one. Which one was that? Oh, sh- old that was the Old Man Rhythm, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, he's, he's cute and all that, but there's there's a reason why he was a better songwriter. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> Actually, we saw that in his hospital. Yeah. yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Oh, he brought God. the whole family in when he was sick after his brain surgery. Mm-hmm. And on, on was his birthday. Yep. How was that? Did he? We don't know much about when he was ill. Um, we we never asked while your mother was alive. It didn't seem. Yeah, that no, that was a tough time. I mean, yeah. I remember. See, I was fourteen or so, fourteen and a half. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you go in, and he lost. I mean, he was a hardy man. And he was probably down to one hundred and fifty pounds. He was real skinny, and it was weird because he was. They kept depressed. saying he was depressed. He was depressed. He he would look he right at was, you. He, he couldn't would talk. He couldn't. He couldn't talk. He, he, his eyes were open. He looked like he was alert, but he couldn't respond. He couldn't respond at all. Except he'd, he'd cry. Blinked his eyes. Yeah, he'd cry occasionally. Really. And the tough part was a lot of a lot of friends really wouldn't come and see him. They couldn't. Yeah. They weren't allowed to. They weren't. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, we yeah. have letters. They weren't allowed to. Fred Astaire, I remember, came and visited. Her. They weren't allowed to come. Mom wouldn't let. They didn't want. She didn't want them to see him the way he was. Yeah. We have letters in the collection. Um, you know, dear John, we hope you're doing better. I can't. We're not able to reach you. We're hoping. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing this letter, hoping that it will get to you. Oh wow. Know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. She wouldn't let him. And she wouldn't tell him he was dying either. Yeah, it was hard for her to do. It was hard for the people. It was hard for me to talk to people. Yeah. Because I wasn't allowed to talk to and tell them anything. I talked to them or anything. Yeah. That makes it really hard. Yeah. That was hard for me. Because he was like a professional grandfather, you know. See, I, I never even knew he was famous. Mm-hmm. I'd get, he'd always talk about, you know, all the Bob, Bob Hope and Fred. i go, I heard of Bob Hope. Never heard of you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Fred is there. Never heard of you. But I mean, he he was great. I remember one time he took me to a toy store and we bought this little toy submarine and put pellets in and it would sink to the bottom and then the pellet would fill up and then the boat, the submarine would rise back up. And, mm-hmm. and so he took us back to the Bel Air house and me and him snuck into his next door neighbor, Jim Ray's house. Because <laughs> he didn't have the Bel Air house didn't have, didn't a pool. have a pool. So we couldn't test the <laughs> submarines that we'd bought out. So me and him snuck in, broke into his I backyard. I didn't know that story. Broke into his backyard. And we were trying out our submarines. And right as they and they went down to the bottom. His came back up. Mine didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's Bebo, so he's looking around for a net to fish my submarine. And here comes Jim Ray. Oh, he's <laughs> furious, I know. He it wasn't was a very pleasant furious. man. No, he wasn't. And, uh, oh, he wasn't a very oh, pleasant God. man at all. And uh, God, what else would he do? You remember when he took a bunch of us to Ringling Brothers? Yeah. He took a bunch of us to Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and we went to this little toy store. And we bought these little teeny plastic pellet guns. They weren't even pellet guns. They shot these little teeny submarines. And when we got to the circus, we, me and Beba and my friends, we were <laughs> shooting the, the characters as they were parading around. So we were hiding in this little box. We are going, pew, pew. We were shooting these little pellets at the entertainers as they're parading around, Ringling Brothers. And then uh, I, I hit an elephant, and this elephant responded. My grandfather's all, oh, we better stop that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you had trouble. And then the pin, oh boy, and when we go swimming, see, he had this theory. He, he loved to lock himself in a hot car till we got all sweat. So me, my brother, my dad, and Bebop would sit. We'd lock ourselves in a car for an hour, 45 minutes an hour, till we were dripping sweat. And we'd be, we'd turn on a baseball game and we'd be listening to it. Then we'd all be good. My Ready, brother guys? did this too. Oh, we'd be dying. Oh. And then we'd jump out of the car and we'd go running into the pool. <laughs> we'd jump into the pool and, uh, and then we'd, we'd dry off and we'd get back into the car. <laughs> kind of like the opposite of a sauna. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Jeff was my brother. Oh, I, I don't oh, know if they were that. Jeff or Biba, but they, Be- they all did it. Oh, all the boys crazy. did it. <laughs> 
Oh, and then he'd be driving around. Well, you, I don't know if anyone ever talked about his Pinto. Hmm. He had a 1971 beige Pinto with red interior. And he had a car phone in it. Because <laughs> he'd buy Grandma all the elegant Jaguar. She always had a Jaguar every other year or something. She'd get the Jaguar, but he... Didn't, he wasn't into the fancy yeah. cars, so he bought this beige Pinto, one of the old hatchbacks, and he had a telephone installed in one of the first car phones. And he he never used it. The only matter of fact, the only calls that he ever had on it was me. Because he, 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 he go, you want to use my phone? Because <laughs> no one ever used it. So, hey, Mom, I'm in Bebo's car. <laughs> and, no, oh. The way he bought cars was he bought a Skylark because he had written the song. <laughs> and then the car came back called the Skylark. That's a wonderful reason. That's the reason he bought. <laughs> oh God! And then in that pinto, he would, he would. What he'd do is he would take his hands off the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Because in, in Bel Air, there, I don't know, you know, driving around mm -hmm. in Bel Air, he'd take his hands off the wheel and go, Oh no, we're out of control. Uh, we're out of control. Wait, wait. He used to do that to me when knees. I was a kid going to Palm Springs too. He'd be steering it with his knees. I'd be screaming. Yeah. It was like a roller coaster. He did that to me when I was a little girl, too. We'd be on our hallway to Palm Springs and he'd take. And <laughs> no, I'd grab I mean, all of the wheel. <laughs> it was fun, man. I mean, he, he was great. He went and bought us a boat for the Palm, Palm Springs house. had that big pool in it. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures. Of I've seen Palm a Spring. picture, so mm -hmm. I kind of have an idea. i got to bring you those those photo albums. You, can, you should probably take one. Uh, because I got like four of them, got four photo albums of the Palm Springs house. Uh, but he bought a boat. He bought us, <laughs> me and John, a yeah. boat. We'd, oh, we'd this. be rowing. Oh, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be rowing in this boat. Well, it wasn't that huge. It was just huge. It was huge for me. I was six years old. Yeah. But that boat was actually still at the Palm Springs house when yeah. we went and sold it in 96. I found it all broken up in the back. It was great, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I. You remember when he took my baseball team to Farrell's? Yeah. He came to my little league game. We won the championship yes. game. Yeah. <laughs> took everybody. Did everybody come? Shut down an ice cream parlor. Spent a thousand bucks <laughs> in 1970. That was <laughs> on ice cream zoos. <laughs> by the zoo at yeah. Farrell's and it was just like this vat of ice cream and have monkeys hanging around and everything yeah no. he was funny he'd oh, dress me up yeah. in his clothes and stuff he'd always put his hat and his glasses on dressed just like me me and him no, he was a good oh, guy God, he, was. he was all natural I never forget it because he never he was the true southern gentleman he was he was he my family was him. most most important to him that was yeah his yeah. grandmother his mother he'd bring her up that was his he called her they're all in the movie. You know, the letters would be to my oh, You know, they would Lillian talk. And, I remember one time in Thanksgiving, the, when we were in Palm Springs. Yeah. And, and he would he would dress in like a Colonel Sanders outfit. I mean, he would dress in this white yeah. southern outfit with the little bow tie. And he talked in a language. That they talk Gullah. They talk they Gullah. I yeah. couldn't even She's understand no them. Yeah, I mean... I know what it is. I don't understand it. Yeah, I, Granny and he would talk Gullah together. Yeah, so you'd talk. never know what they were saying. <laughs> and he'd write her letters. I have letters that he wrote her. Oh, you do? Gullah, yeah. I got them in a book ready to fall apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I can read them. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I couldn't understand them if I heard them, but I can read what they say, you know. Darling Miss Lillian, <laughs> you know, just, it was cool, oh God. He just adored his family, that was the most important thing in the world to him, you know. Mm -hmm. That came before everything. And when my mom would get mad at him and say, you should save more money and do this and yeah. that. And that and 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 yeah, most of their fights were know, over money. him being good to family, spending his money. Oh, he says, it's my money, I spend it the way I want. And he wanted to spend it on his family, you know. 
<laughs> he was ridiculous. He spoiled and salt to death. His children, his grandchildren, his mom, his nieces, his nephews, you know, just, you know, his family was number one. Even on her family. <laughs> it was so funny. He spoiled her family and she could add it up. What kind of things did he do when huh? he did that? What kind of things did he do when he did that? He would just, oh, he'd come into town and take everyone to out to dinner. I mean, ever there'd be 10 people in a family go down to Savannah, the, all the relatives. Yeah. He'd come out here, like when I got married to uh, Jamie's dad. His, Jamie's dad's family came out. Uh, and and uh, some of their friends, so my dad took them all out to dinner. Yeah. Grandpa, Grandpa Sam, one time, my dad's father said, uh, Johnny, I'm taking you out to dinner. You pick anywhere you want. And, you know, <laughs> my grandfather's fine. He picked this place. And I mean, <laughs> Grandpa Sam was a dentist. He didn't have a whole lot of money. They went out to dinner. It was $300. But daddy's always taking everybody else to dinner, right? Yeah. So he wanted to, he wanted to take it. He had no idea that... He brought like about three hundred and fifty dollars just to play it safe, but he didn't think you'd have to spend all of the money on it. <laughs> oh, he was more smart. careful after that. <laughs> he was great. I remember when well you remember we went to Scotland, he took he found he hunted down the shop. See, I call him Bebop. That's what that's the name I called him growing up. And he found the shop in Scotland named Bebop's. So he actually, when he was down there, found the shop and took a picture of it and sent it to me. <laughs> Come on, uh, see, see, you didn't make this name up here. It was the perfect yeah. <laughs> name for me. He signed everything Bebop. Bebop Grand Ginger. I didn't even know they had names for <laughs> 10, 12 years. And from the South, he was Bubba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't know that. I was mentioning to your mom that um, we took some photographs down for his sister to look at, mm -hmm. to try to identify, because they were so old and kind of faded, and we just didn't know. We thought some of them had him in them. And we gave her one, and she kind of looked puzzled, and she looked at it, and her face lit up, and she said, Bubba! Yeah. And I almost fell over because we hadn't heard anybody use that name in connection yeah. with him. I said, okay, so that's your brother? Yes, that's my brother. That's Bubba. Okay. Yeah, you got Bubba from from her and then he got Bubba from Jamie because Jamie couldn't say Grandpa. It's better than what my brother did. He called my grandmother Doo-Doo for two years. Oh, no. <laughs> my parents were horrified. But those were the words he could say. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, that sounds like an awfully nice man to know. Yeah, no, he was. He was. He'd take me down to Com uh, Commander, or was that Commodore? Commander. Remember we had the, that studio. He yeah. Had. We'd watch him taping uh, when he was recording Frasier. That's all I remember. I was too young for most of that stuff. Yeah. Then I got too disinterested by when I got 14, 15. Things got a little tough. Well, they were off in England then, yeah. so much. Yeah, Nikki yeah. got to go to England. I was jealous. Yeah. How could she go to She was me? miserable. Yeah, she had a terrible time. <laughs> she had a terrible time. Grand Ginger was... Doing her thing. Yeah. Did Ginger talk about the, the, uh, Mia Farrow at all during that Good Companion <laughs> We never had a chance really to talk with her about anything. Oh wow! Because when she came to Georgia, she generally the, the provost really enjoyed her company, mm. and we usually had an event going on, so that you know she'd come to the event, and then he usually had a luncheon thing going on, and then frequently she was on her way somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So we got to say hello and goodbye, yeah. and, oh, and my. you know, can we get you a drink? And that was that was frequently about it. So we didn't. Oh, wow. I really wanted to sit down with her and just say, you know, what was this like, or what was that like, or. She would have been the best person for that stuff. They were, um, they rented flats in England when they were doing Good Companions. And Andre Previn was married to Mia Farrow at the time. And, uh, 
grandma used to say Mia Farrow was just the dawdling little housewife. She spent two hours every single day cleaning the toilets. <laughs> because she said, Andre, Andre has to have his toilet bowls teacup clean. <laughs> And, uh, that was one of her perks. That was one of her. She goes through fads, Mia. That was one of her fads, being a wife. <laughs> being a household. We've heard that your dad really enjoyed Europe, though, really enjoyed visiting. Is that. Yeah, well, they, did, they didn't visit that much, but. No, but that particular. He went to England. Good companions. Well, he loved that era. Because, yeah. He because, loved... see, England appreciates, they still knew him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, the problem with America is yeah. he was kind of a forgotten guy. Even when he'd win an Academy Award or something, yeah. they, you know, they just didn't know who he was. He wasn't an entertainer anymore. He was primarily a uh, movie score writer. And he was in the background. And he was still make, earning money, but he wasn't in the limelight at all. But he'd go to England. They go, the world famous Johnny Mercer. They have him on every TV show, <laughs> yeah. every radio show down there. Uh, and he sent me all the all the newspapers. And yeah, everything. yeah, and young people knew who he was. You know, good companions actually did very, very well there. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so funny because I had a drama teacher in school, uh, this British actor named Monty Ash. Oh yeah. When he found Monty. out. My grandfather wrote Good Companions. He's just like, I was in Good Companions. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was the greatest. And it, it was a very popular play. So yeah. he never had a Broadway hit, but that was the closest he ever came. Yeah. It was a huge <coughs> success in the play. Oh, and I think that's why he liked did. England. He hated the weather there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he didn't like the food very much. He was a big eater. He loved food. He didn't like the food very much there. And... Uh, I never forget, he, remember he broke his finger when he was in Europe? He hated doctor, European doctors. He yeah. He a European doctor, so when he came back when from Europe... When he got Europe, sick, he said, take me home, Mom. Yeah. Go I remember home. he was in France and he broke his finger. He landed, he was playing, horsing around, he landed, he busted his finger, and he refused to go to the doctor. So it Ooh. healed like this. Yeah. So for the last five years of his life, he had this finger like this. And... I go, Grandpa, what's with your finger? And he goes, here's for you to play with. And he go like this. Like so, <laughs> all the time I'd be going like that. And, uh, he was a good boy. He was just a lot of fun. I, miss him. I wish I knew him now, man. That's the tough part. Yeah. To say to him all the things. Well, it's knowing people and wishing them. They could have known him, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, to think he'd still be writing great songs. I mean, to think how many songs he wrote right before he died. I mean, he, he probably had another two or three hundred songs in him. Cause he well, was, it, it's too bad that he died when he did, because that kind of music has come back. Yeah. And he died when it was so thoroughly out. But yeah. He better than ever. As a matter of fact, that first Wise Club, you know that new movie with Goldie Hawn? It says it's got three... Mercer tune. Does it? Yeah. yeah. It's got In the Cool 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 of the Evening, Tangerine, and Moon River. Well, we notice it all the time in advertising. Yeah. For a while, about a year ago, there were two or three really upscale cars, and one was using Dream, I think, and mm -hmm. one was using I Remember You. Yeah. And there was no text. I still don't remember what cars these things yeah. were, but it, was, it gave you this very sophisticated, you know, wonderful, right. upscale kind of feeling. And I laughed. I thought, he's still here. <laughs> yeah. He's with us. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what's amazing about his music. When, and when you look at some of the royalty checks and money that he's earning in Argentina and yeah. in Japan. I mean, Japan is all amazing. Of lot, the, all of Japan, really? I'd say Japan plays almost as much yeah. of his music as the United States. I well, I know we had a, um, a call from the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. Somebody who publishes a magazine and they were doing a Johnny Mercer article or whatever and they needed photographs for it. I said, Netherlands? Sure, fine. Yeah. <laughs> if he's yeah. popular there, that's good. And they said they had a concert coming up that yeah. was going to focus on, yeah, mostly on his music. Wow. This was about four years ago, maybe? Yeah. Five years, something like that. They really like him, yeah. 
Did you guys get an opportunity to see the play at all that was done by, did you tell her about that at all? Which play? Uh, Las Vegas. Uh, He's got the guys in Las Vegas at, yeah. the, at the university. Uni UNLV. UNLV. Uh, drama department. A marvelous little thing. Oh, they have called us though. Have they? They were looking for some words. Yeah. Just some songs. And really, it sounds it's wonderful. Darling. Oh, yeah, they it's a should play. be able to show it, yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. the the fellow who headed that was talking to me, he said, Has anybody ever done a book on the lyrics? I said, No. Not really. There's there's been the coffee table yeah. book that has lyrics in it, but no, so I'm hoping, you know, that yeah. they'll take it and maybe publish something from it. Because the show they can only take so many places, but if they publish something, yeah. people right. can buy the whatever the book is or the, the article or whatever. Well, I had some marvelous kids in that show, too, just, oh, God, they were good. Some of them were so good. Oh. I'll tell you what, we're just too about bad a cat and going good. Can't go anywhere with it as long as Margaret's fooling around with her. Well, there, there can be other shows, though. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, it's, it's not, I don't think it's that exclusive. It's it's not, not, okay, then I'm so. going to try to find them. And <laughs> <laughs> tell them it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're almost out of tape, but I think we've gotten some really good stories and memories. And I want to say thank you to both of you. Oh, thank you. And um, we will be back. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll be here. <laughs>